Uh, thank you for coming. Another hand, please, for Adrienne Louis from the Healing Arts Program at Tucson Medical Center. And a special thanks to the program coordinator there, Lauren Robb, uh, who has um, brought us all these mu musical preludes during the series. Uh, my name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Don Bennett Mean Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And uh, it's a delight to welcome all of you to the third of four uh, of our lectures on animalities. And if you, uh, if this is by chance your first visit to the series, uh, then I can guess from the topic uh, that you're a cat lover. <laughs> um, the, the talk tonight is going to be stylistically a little bit different uh, from the other two talks. Um, but what they all have in common uh, so far is to inform us that animals don't just inflect our social lives, but actually produce our social structures. Uh, it's a pleasure of mine to give thanks to all the people who have contributed financially uh, to uh, the success of this series. The first, I would like to thank our title sponsors, Hello Alua Companies, uh, Mike and Beth, Beth Kasser. They do so much uh, for uh, supporting culture in downtown Tucson, and uh, it's fabulous that they're in Tucson and not in Hawaii. Um, SBS Advisory Board members Ken and Linda Robin, and our supporting sponsor, AZPM, as well as our great uh, community sponsors, Drs. Vivi and Adib Sabah, and Dr. Barbara Starrett, and Joanne Ellison, and Park Tucson, and this uh, fabulous uh, Fox Theater. So thank everyone for your support. Our speaker tonight is Allison Hawthorne Deming. Uh, she is a Regents Professor of Creative Writing in the Department of English in the College of SBS. And she's also the Agnes Nelms Howry Chair of Environment and Social Justice at the University of Arizona. She writes evocative and really dazzling language that encourages us to traverse and rethink the boundaries between categories like science and art and nature and culture and the human and the non-human. And uh, in some 12 books, uh, she has demonstrated um, her facility with genres, both poetry and the essay form. And my favorite among them is the book Zoologies on Animals and the Human Spirit from 2014. She tackles all kinds of animals, dogs and cats, but also rabbits on Mars in that book. And the book itself is something of an inspiration uh, for this series. Uh, and I want to thank her for that because uh, I started thinking about animals uh, as a topic uh, once I got my hand on that book. And you can get your hand on that book, as they say, uh, in better bookstores. You know the bookstore is good because the book is there. Um, she has literally hundreds of uh, um, presentations, recitals, and so on at, uh, at various places across the world. Um, uh, publications in uh, literary magazines and journals, reprints in anthologies, and, and media appearances. And you don't get to be a Regents Professor at the University of Arizona without winning some awards. And in her case, uh, among many are the Walt Whitman Award from the, uh, American, the Academy of American Poets, the uh, Bear Award for Science Writing, a Pushcart Prize, and a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome 
to Allison Hawthorne Deming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, JP. Thank you all for coming. I'm thrilled to be part of this series. When I was working on my book, Zoologies, I wanted to explore how important animals had been throughout human history. They've contributed to us in terms of food, clothing, shelter, art, religion, mythology. And that connection is easy to read. It's easy to feel how deep and profound it is when we look at charismatic animals, like the bison and the dog, as we have in the last two weeks. But herring? Well, I hope by the end of this evening that you have, have, will have opened a space in your heart for this humble fish of the northern waters and its importance to human cultures on both sides of the Atlantic. So here's a herring. I'm going to speak about the North Atlantic herring. There are probably around 200 species of herring in the world. This is a very, very abundant fish. In fact, it's one of the few species where we can have the experience of abundance in this age of diminishment and elegy when we think about the animal world. Linnaeus called the uh, herring Copiosissimus piscus, the most abundant fish. This global map shows the territory for the Northern Atlantic, and you can see they like the uh, eastern shoreboard, but going up towards uh, the Canadian Maritimes, Newfoundland, Greenland, and up around Great Britain and the Scandinavian countries. This is a really important uh, factor about the life of the herring, that it loves cold water. And uh, it also, though, is extremely adaptive and resilient. So the herring can breed in the spring or in the fall. It can apparently adapt to highly saline water as it has in the Baltic Sea. So it's really quite a remarkable creature and of least concern to conservation biologists, thankfully. It's not without concerns, of course, as you will see. So here's a herring resting in its bed of ice, a happy location for it, although this isn't the live one. <laughs> well, that's not so happy. Herring have had a lot of nicknames over time. Um, in Scotland, they've been called the Silver Darlings. In Great Britain, the Silver of the Sea. Uh, in uh, Great Britain, also, they were, called, they were called the Potato of the Middle Ages. They've been found in Viking middens, uh, in Roman middens. Uh, they help to fuel and feed the Industrial Revolution as a staple food for coal miners and mill workers. They even help to support enslaved Africans working in southern plantations in the United States. There's a, an account by um, Francis Frederick of uh, his, his reporting that during the winter months, he was given one salt herring in the morning, uh, which, of course, helped as a protein source to get people through uh, the gruesome labor. I'm going to focus on this small island off the eastern coast of Canada, Grand Manan Island. Uh, and uh, this is a place I grew up in Connecticut. My family was looking for an out-of-the-way vacation place that didn't feel like a vacation place. It was kind of a working place. And they read an article about this little island off of the coast of New Brunswick, Grand Manan Island, about 20 miles long, 10 miles wide, about 2,500 residents, year-round residents, a pretty stable population for the past 200 years. As far as we know, there were not permanent residences for native people, although we know that Passamaquoddy people came over from Maine and New Brunswick in canoes for many hundreds of years, maybe longer, and they had seasonal encampments on the island where they would hunt for porpoises or shellfish, um, dry them, and then take them back to the mainland. But the waters are pretty rugged up there, and therefore this is not the most hospitable place in the world to be paddling in a dugout canoe across the open sea. 
It's also extremely rugged. The western coast, which is what's facing the mainland, is, is very high, steep basaltic cliffs. So there really isn't a place for safe moorage over there. The island was settled per with permanent residents in the 1700s by loyalists during the American Revolution. Many of these people lost their homes um, or were exiled at the time if they remained loyal to the crown. So there were around 30,000 um, emigres from New England who came up to the maritime provinces at that time. It, it also is apparent from some materials I've read that you could actually be voted onto this island. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes in poor communities on the mainland, uh, if someone couldn't pay their bills or might be a petty thief or might be different in some way that the town found unacceptable, uh, people could actually be voted off and were sometimes exiled to Grand Manan Island where they were out of the way. Th this may account for the fierce and independent spirit that <laughs> continues to this day on Grand Manan Island. So my credentials for this talk, everybody says, Herring, why are you so interested in Herring? Well, here are my credentials. I started going to this island when I was nine years old uh, with my family. This is uh, a photograph of me with my parents. And you'll note that I am clutching to my beloved father with one arm, but with the other, I am holding my trusty brownie Hawkeye camera. Uh, very important, the beginning of my career as a documentarian. The other photograph is of the little cottage that we bought for practically nothing, a very derelict, run-down cottage no one had lived in for quite some time. It had been built in 1864 by a man named James Smith, a local fisherman, uh, and he had built it, as many of the homes at that time were built, harvesting uh, timbers off of his land, uh, milling uh, the timbers, stones out of the forest. This is a, a rough built home. Uh, no fancy Cape Cod or Hamptons <laughs> residence up here. Uh, it had no flush toilet, it had an outhouse. It's improved a little bit over the years. But this house was in the James Smith family from 1864 until it came into our family in 1957, where it has remained. This island really, I think, keyed me to a lifelong interest in how deeply interwoven the relationship between nature and culture is, that it's utterly inextricable. And here, because people live by the sea, you are very aware of that continually. Well, here's one of my very first po photos <laughs> with my trusty brownie Hawkeye camera, uh, complete with all the crinkles and wrinkles that it has amassed in the uh, subsequent half century plus. This is a photograph of a uh, fisherman seining a ware, and you'll hear a lot about herring wares. By the end of the evening, you'll know a lot about them. Um, this particular ware is called the mystery. All the wares have names. Uh, islanders uh, like to, uh, they have this wry sense of humor, which, which I think helps everybody get along when you live with 2,500 people that you see, you know, every day, forever. Uh, and uh, when asked, why do you call this where the mystery where, the operator said, well, it's a mystery why so many families have managed to make a living for so long out of it. But I was transfixed by this image of men working so hard to haul this bounty of fish into their boats. It's, it's sort of beautiful and terrible and incredibly intense. And uh, they completely captured me, both the men doing the work and the fish struggling, both struggling equally in a way for their lives and livelihood. So herring, as I've said, are bountiful and in a way they mean bounty. Um, being numerous is a very good defense. Uh, there is lots of evidence that when they have been overfished, as fishing techniques have gotten more and more sophisticated and boats get bigger and they can go out into deeper water to chase the fish wherever they go, uh, there have been times when there has been overfishing of the herring. Uh, but what's happened is that regulations come in 
the herring rebound. They are very resilient. That's happened in Iceland. It's happened in the Canadian Maritimes. Um, unlike other fish, which have a harder time rebounding, such as the cod in Newfoundland, the herring um, do very well in their abundance. They can migrate in shoals as long as nine miles and as wide as two miles. I mean, these are enormous, uh, enormous schools or shoals of fish migrating in the North Atlantic. What do they live on? They live on this tiny organism, the size of a kernel of rice. This is Calinus finmarchicus. It's a copepod or form of zooplankton. It has a massive oil sac in its body, so it's a wonderful source of nutrition. And it supports lots of organisms in the food web, herring, shrimp, all the way up to the baleen whales. So you have some of the largest animals on Earth are supported by some of the smallest organisms on Earth. There are some very interesting things about the relationship between the herring and the Calinus finmarchicus. When the herring are feeding in an abundant field, shall we say, of this particular copepod, they, um, they fish with a strategy that's called synchropredation, or I think less poetically, sometimes called ram feeding. So the herring line up at the exact distance from one another that is the jump distance of the prey. So herring's coming up behind a little copepod. He says, oh, I'll get out of the way, and right in front of the mouth of the next herring. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a very effective jump that they have, but what's particularly interesting is that 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 relationship, that behavior of the prey is actually shaping some of the important social structure and behavior of the herring. Here's the region that we're talking about. This is the Great Atlantic Shelf. So before, uh, uh, before well, 12,000 years ago, this area was submerged in water. Uh, when the uh, last ice age melted, uh, this uh, became the landform that we're aware of now. And um, it, it, it is a very abundant area for fishing, in part because you have these two currents. You have warm water coming up from the Gulf Stream, ever warmer, and you have cold water coming down from the Labrador current. And the effect of this is to create uh, a, very, uh, a very habitable area for these Calinus finmarchicus, as well as many other animals that feed in the area. So certainly, native peoples would have been fishing along these shorelines for thousands of years. But in terms of uh, fishing by Europeans, the American Museum of Natural History reports that by the year 1000, Basque fishers from northern Spain had come over to this region, the Grand Banks, off of this uh, great Atlantic shelf, and they had uh, created an international fishing trade, taking salt fish back to Europe. So they managed to keep this bountiful fishing ground a secret from other Europeans for around 500 years. Then a fellow known as Giovanni Cabato, or who we know as John Cabot, an Italian explorer uh, captaining an English ship, came to this region looking for a spice route and found 1,000 Basque vessels fishing in these waters. And, well, it was then discovered and um, became uh, uh, not a source for spice, but a source for other goods of value. Uh, it was said at this time, legend holds, that you could scoop the fish up with a bucket. They were so bountiful. I'm going to, before I focus on Grand Manan, I want to show you a little bit of context about uh, the Atlantic fishery on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, because there's very strong similarity between what was going on there and, and what has gone on in the Northeast, in the Maritimes, and in New England. So this is, a, this is an image of the, what are known as the Scottish herring lasses. 
uh, they would go from village to village as the fish came in, and uh, they would work on the shore. Very often, the work on the docks was done by women cleaning and sorting um, the fish. And uh, this is, uh, you would have seen a scene like this in Great Britain, maybe as early as the 1500s, and certainly in New England in the 1800s. Salting was a primary way of curing fish and preserving them before we had refrigeration, and another method, of course, was smoking. Here's a, uh, an engraving from France from 1878 where the fish are being smoked right in the chimney of the fire. Here's another image of these uh, wonderful salted fish barrels. Again, the Scottish herring lassies happily working away. Uh, I don't know how they make them all look so happy. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau, uh, when he visited Cape Cod uh, and, and wrote about it in 1851, actually wrote about that metaphor of the barrels being like corded wood, he said. I mistook them for this at first, and such in one sense they were, fuel to maintain our vital fires, and eastern wood which grew on the Grand Banks. Again, the women working at cleaning and sorting the fish, uh, this very common and also part of the social life of women. Um, the, and I love to imagine the possibly bawdy girl talk that went on, uh, or, or the griping about what was going on at home or in the village square that went on as they worked side by side at, at long labor um, in these villages as the fish came in. The women also, the same thing in Iceland where they had a very, uh, very large uh, herring fishery for centuries. The, the women there would come into Siglofador, which was the, the center of the herring industry there, and they would stay in a dormitory. They didn't go from village to village because the harvesting was focused in this one northern village in Iceland, but they had dorms. They would come in from other villages and stay there and work away. I don't know how this woman is looking so very happy, but she's another Scottish herring lass, and uh, I, I love this picture of her. She may be taking these baskets of fish to, uh, to be sold um, on the streets of the village or house to house, but I love uh, her apparent joy, and I also love those leg of mutton sleeves, and just imagine the muscles she has under there of this hard-working woman. So here's the region that I'm going to focus on. Uh, this little island is Grand Manan Island. This is Nova Scotia, Cape Cod. All of this is the Gulf of Maine. And up here, this long, deep bay is the Bay of Fundy. The Bay of Fundy has the highest tides in the world. Up at the head of the bay, they can be 40, 50 feet. That's the difference between high and low tide. And uh, out at the mouth of the bay, where we are, is a little more modest, 20 feet, maybe 30 at the highest uh, tides of the year. So these are perilous and difficult waters. They're full of currents and rips and unexpected occurrences that can blow up out of nowhere. And uh, so this, while it's very good um, fishing, uh, fishing territory, it's also uh, somewhat perilous. And as some of you may very well know, if you're interested in fishing, commercial fishing is the most dangerous profession in the world. And people are lost uh, in every fishing community. Every fishing community knows people who've been lost. So there is a kind of grief and social connection that comes from uh, that shared peril of those who work uh, in the fishery. So the herring will migrate up into this area in the summer. This is where their spawning ground is. So Grand Manan is like smack dab in the middle of it. So it's a wonderful place for herring fishing to happen. But of course, it depends on the herring arriving there. Herring generally follow a fairly predictable migration routes, and then they can change their mind and do something different. 
And I asked Andy Pershing at the uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, well, how come? Why would they change like that? And he said, oh, it has to do with the food. If the food aren't there, the fish aren't there. No Calanus finmarchicus, no herring. On Grand Banana Island, the predominant method for fishing is this structure called the herring ware. It's a commercial adaptation of indigenous methods of fishing, uh, and it's been used on this island for a couple of hundred years. This is a ware called Pat's Cove ware. It's operated by the Ingalls family. This is, this is ware is, as the islanders would say, all dressed for the hundredth year uh, this last summer. The way it works is the herring come to shore at night to feed. And as they come in, they're chasing the prey which come to the shore at night. They'll run into this fence which directs them in this direction. They go through this little gate, and once they get in here, they tend to circle and circle and circle. And instinct never tells a herring, hey, swim towards shore. <laughs> instinct tells a herring, swim toward the sea. And when it does, it just ends up circling and circling and stuck in the wear. And so uh, those nets go all the way down to the seabed, and then um, you'll see exactly how they harvest them. It's kind of a thrilling and wonderful experience. All of these wares are quite unique. This is one called the intruder. This one is, is uh, a, a kind of squeezed in form because the seabed drops off there, and so uh, you, you just can't get the stakes uh, into the seabed. So it's a kind of squished wear. But it takes enormous skill and, and many decades of learning to know how to build these things. Reading the sea, reading the tides, reading the behavior of the fish, reading the terrain of the seabed, and uh, knowing how the fish are going to move and where to put that fence to gather them in. It's, a, it's an amazingly impressive uh, technology. And it's beautiful. They look like works of art, don't they? I think they look more like art than a, than a fish net. Here's a close-up of how the, uh, the twine is laced together. You can see how the bottom nets drop all the way down, and then they stitch up uh, nets all the way to the top. They have to be rebuilt every spring and summer, an expensive and labor-intensive effort. This hasn't always been the way fishing was done in the region. Uh, in the 1800s, this is Winslow Homer's wonderful painting, The Herring Net, uh, from 1885. So this is a dory. The small boat is a dory, and they're gill netting for herring. If you look in the background, you see these hazy images of schooners. Oh, those are the motherships. So the motherships would go out from port, and it might take them 10 or 11 days to get out to the Grand Banks. They might have 20 dories stacked on deck. When they get out there to the fishing grounds, they take the dories off into the water. The fishermen go out, one or two men to a boat. They fill their boat, they bring it back to the mothership, and they keep doing it until um, they have filled the mothership. Obviously, these are, uh, you can see the sea, even in this one, isn't particularly calm for a small boat like this. Well, there are lots of stories on an island the size of Grand Manan with 2,500 people. And uh, I'm really interested in fishermen's stories and peril and adventure on the high seas. So uh, people told me that a fisherman had been lost at sea who had lived in our house and had lived in his dory for a week. And I heard this story year after year. No, nobody really knew who it was or if it was true. So I went down to the Gramanan archives at the local museum, and the archivist pulled out this newspaper article. And I learned the story of Mantford Smith, the son of James Smith who built our house. Manfred Smith, at age 19, went to sea on a ship called the Nellie Woodbury. They were, uh, there was a crew from both Grand Manan and Eastport, Maine, which was common in those days, New Brunswick and Maine fishers working together. This is 1887. They go out, heading to the Grand Banks. They have 2,800 bushels of salt on board the schooner in order to cure the fish that they catch. They're going to be out for 116 days. They're under sail power, only sail power. This is May. They get out there, and the captain sees the barometer dive. 
he's concerned, blows a warning to the men out in their dories. He's got 21 men out in 20 dories, out in these waves like we saw in Winslow Homers. He blows the warning for the fishermen to come back. They ignore it. They're fishermen. He blows the warning again. One of the fishermen holds up a cod and pats it and gives him a big grin. And the captain says, you guys are going to die one of these days for your foolishness. Doesn't stop them. They've got fish fever and they're going for it. The storm blew up. Very unexpected squall. Waves so high that the captain couldn't even see some of the dories as they rose up behind a wave. They managed to get six or seven of the dories over to the mothership and the men got on board. Manford Smith was blown 20 to 30 miles away from the mothership. And he, was, he threw all the fish that he had in his boat off into the water. He, was, he tried to row back to get to where the boat was. When he finally saw it, his oar locks broke. And he was so tired, he said, I didn't have the strength of a mouse. So he finally, he finally got back to the ship. They tried to throw a rope to him. He, couldn't, he didn't have the strength to hold it, so they tied it around his waist. The sea was so high that they couldn't even pull him up out of the boat, so they spilled, they had gathered cod liver oil, they spilled cod liver oil from the mothership, which calmed the waters a bit, after which they could pull him up by the waist on this rope, and he said, I couldn't stand up, I was so weak. And the last thing he said, uh, Manfred Smith, age 19, was, I shall never forget seeing his, his friend Lapril, seeing his hand rise up out of the water as he went down and tried to wave goodbye to me. They went back. It took them 11 days to get back home. They had lost all of the other Grand Mananers who were on that ship. Manfred was the only one to survive. The next October, Manfred Smith went out with that same captain again, back to the Grand Banks to fish. This is just one story. There's, there are just endless stories of the courage, bravery, and ruggedness of working in these waters. It made me want to know more about the history of the fishery and, and the precursors to the fishery that happens on Grand Banana Island. So I wondered what I had heard that uh, indigenous people used these methods uh, of building wares. And, and the oldest record that, that I have encountered uh, is of this Sebastocook Lake uh, Ware complex, which has been, uh, it, was, it was a study published in 1994 in the archeology span of Eastern North America. Uh, that documented the use of ground penetrating radar and other technologies to, to determine that there were over 600 sharpened stakes driven into the glacial mud of this lake to build a wear structure where the fish would enter in as they were migrating and then could be captured and, and harvested in these baskets. I, this is fresh water, so these were probably alewives that they were catching, which are a relative of the Atlantic herring. That's, that is, has been carbon dated to about uh, 7,800 years ago. It may be the oldest documented wear site in all of North America. So these methods have been used for a very, very, very long time. The, er, the earliest record that I can find, written record of the building of a weir, was by uh, Captain William Pote. He was a sea captain sailing from Boston to Nova Scotia, and he was captured by a band of Indians that he called herons, like the bird. Nobody knows that of any um, group of Indians called the herons, so it was most likely, history suggests, it would have been Maliseet um, people in New Brunswick. And he was held captive for two years, uh, and during that time, there was a long forced march. And he reports in this really fascinating journal of his captivity of them finding a big mass of salmon playing in an, uh, a stream as it was um, uh, the outlet coming into the sea. And so the Indians immediately 
built a wear using brush and blankets. They stopped it up and they gathered 40 or 50 salmon, which they then dried over a fire and put in their packs and carried on with their journey. So that's in the mid-1700s. We know that this is a, a method that was certainly used um, by native people um, in the area. So there's a tradition that, that's lasted uh, a few thousand years. So what happened with the Anglos? Well, the first documentation we have of the Anglos is T.W. Smiley, the first photographer for the Smithsonian Institution. He comes up to Eastport, Maine in the 1880s and takes photographs and makes engravings of the fishing um, methods that are being used at that time, and they are brush wares. I should say, um, sardine and herring, I sort of use those words um, uh, interchangeably. A, a sardine generally in this part of the world, uh, or in that part of the world, is a juvenile uh, herring. A sardine in Sardinia might be a juvenile pilchard. So sardine is a little bit of a generic um, term for a, a, a juvenile fish like a herring. So you can see that the structure is very much like that very early um, Sebastic Cook Lake structure built just with brush and sticks along the shore. Here you can see what the islanders still would call top brush, and there would be bottom brush going down to the bottom of the, of the ware to keep the fish. So the fish swim in at high tide when the tide goes out. They, the fishers can come and gather the fish in carts and take them right into the smokehouses on the land. These are right along the shoreline. There are no nets. This is not an industrial method. This is using the materials at hand at this point in history. So this is in the 1880s. Here's an example of one built along a rocky shore. So you can't even drive stakes like this into the ground on such a rocky shore. So they would build these ballasted structures about three or four feet wide. Uh, so there are rocks in there to anchor these uh, uh, wooden structures where the brush can be um, planted, so to speak. So that is um, a method used on rocky shores. You'll see um, some more evidence of that coming up. Here's the smoke shed. This is more of Smiley's engravings. This is, uh, again, Eastport, Maine, but you'll see that this is really similar to what's going on at Gramanan. This method, the fish are salted, and then they are strung up on these little stakes and carried into the, salting, into the um, smokehouse. That, that um, cart that they're carrying it on is called a herring horse. Of course, there are no horses. The men are the horses, and they're working hard. Here's the smokehouse. You can see the herring high up. There's a slow sawdust fire going on the floor uh, of the smokehouse, and the fish are slowly smoked. The wooden boxes in the foreground are the boxes that were used to ship these fish to the Caribbean, to Venezuela, to places where they lacked refrigeration. And uh, uh, those were 10-pound boxes that were packed for international trade. So it, it's quite interesting that this region had a kind of globalized economy um, from the mid-1800s, or at least late 1800s, into the current time. Kids used to assemble those wooden 10-pound wooden boxes. Some old guy on the island told me, yeah, we got paid a nickel apiece. They loved it. But little Graham and Ann, tiny island, 2,500 people, it became known as the herring capital of the world. In 1884, one million boxes, 20,000 tons, locally caught and processed herring were sent for export. Really, absolutely remarkable. So here's 1938, so we've jumped 50 some odd years. Uh, 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 a photographer came up from New York, George Danielle, and uh, he did a really stunning set of photographs uh, of the herring fishery. And you can see that they're still using these brush wares. There still aren't nets and twine. Um, they're using local resources. This fisherman here is a man named Seton Ellingwood. I think George Daniel was sort of in love with him. There's so many pictures of Seton Ellingwood, and they're all kind of romantic. Um, and he, and he, somebody said, well, of course, he's the James Dean of the fishery. 
<laughs> what he's doing there with his hand over the side is he's feeling for herring uh, with a line dropped down into the weir, and the tension on that line tells him how many herring are in the weir. When they're caught, they're loaded into sardine carrier. In those days, they would have been brought to the smoke houses on the island. And here we see, 1938, really the same thing as we saw in the smiley engravings from the 1880s. Uh, and these are all Grand Manan images uh, of the, um, the herring horses with the men uh, taking the herring into the smoking shed and out of the smoking shed. These are the Seal Cove smoke stands, a really kind of iconic area. Here's, a, here's the, a woman working, as, as, in, as we saw in Scotland and other areas, the women did much of the cleaning and, uh, and um, uh, preparing of the fish after they had been smoked. And, you know, there are a number of interesting aspects to the women's labor in this industry. For one, a neighbor of mine told me, I love this, a neighbor of mine told me she, as a young woman, used to work at the smoke stands, and it would be characteristic to see a line of women at a big table. This is an unusual photograph for the George Daniel one, because it, this is similarly, you know, woman who Jesus yucking it up and bitching and moaning and doing what women love to do when they're hanging out together, um, all lined up at the table. But this neighbor told me, yeah, Shai used to do that work, and, and you know what I did to, to protect my fingers from the fins and the sharp knives? I crocheted finger cots to protect my fingers. It was a sort of beautiful meeting of the domestic and the industrial. The fishing also established other gender patterns for, for the island, which I think are extremely interesting. So you imagine those days when men were at sea for weeks, if not months at a time. Women then at the home became the CEOs, the CFOs. They ran everything. They were in charge of everything and had full responsibility, as they had to, uh, with their husbands at sea uh, for so long. Then when the men came back, <clears throat> the women seated all of that responsibility back to the men. So they became very competent, very skilled, and very, shall we say, wily in how flexible they were in understanding that gender roles uh, could be fluid and probably need to be fluid in this kind of community. There's a Canadian cultural geographer, Joan Marshall, who's written very interestingly about this. There also have been a lot of superstitions about women on, on fishing boats. And for many years, for most of Grand Manan's herring fisheries and other fisheries, uh, fishermen would not take women on the boats. Uh, and it, it, it's a kind of a superstition. Uh, does it make any sense? It's hard to say because some of the other superstitions are don't take a bologna sandwich on a boat and don't wear corduroy on a boat. And, you know, it, it's... When you're engaged in this kind of dangerous work, you need something to blame for misfortune. Unfortunately, women <laughs> were blamed when they weren't even on the boats. Um, but that's changing now, and um, we are certainly uh, happy to see it. In fact, one of my students, uh, Kim Bussing, just had a piece published in Vice about women in the Canadian fishery uh, who are um, now uh, getting uh, on the boats and working side by side with men. The first woman I know who did it was, uh, nobody would take her on. This was maybe 10 years ago. Uh, for either the superstition or figuring she just wouldn't have the stamina and, and um, physical strength for working on a lobster boat, which is very demanding. But it's also very lucrative, and this woman was determined she was going to crew on a lobster boat. And so she persisted. The only guy who would take her on was a captain who was really known as a disreputable, dangerous, probably drug-addicted guy who'd lost a couple guys overboard the previous year, although he did manage to save them. Uh, and so she said, okay, sure. <laughs> so she worked for him for a season. And, and of course, now anybody will hire her and treat her with tremendous respect. So things change. Here's the Seal Cove smoke shed at the time of George Danielle's photograph. Uh, this is again in the 1930s. Uh, these smoke sheds were still operating in the 50s and 60s when I was a child. And uh, it, 
It, I know it doesn't sound very romantic, but it was. You'd drive into a village and you'd smell this beautiful smell of smoking fish and a, a gentle sawdust fire, and you'd look up and you'd see this golden oil dripping off the fish as they were uh, curing in the sheds. I mean, it was, and people on the island still talk about, oh, that smell, what I'd give to smell this. I mean, you're all probably thinking, that's disgusting. But there, there was a sort of sense of community and belonging associated with with um, that smell that, that many people uh, miss terribly. Now all these commercial smoke sheds are gone. Even the sardine factories are gone. There used to be two sardine factories on the island. The market for smoked fish uh, has declined because refrigeration is widespread. And also um, rules about um, safety and health became much more rigid in the 50s and 60s and many of the traditional methods just they couldn't you know rise to that level of um, uh, constriction and the sardine factories closed because uh, they became uh, run by multinational corporations on the mainland and they have no interest in supporting a small community they have interest in efficiency and they have a massive massive sardine factory in Blacks Harbor, New Brunswick now, which is where herring go if they're going to be used uh, for sardines. This map was made by Buchanan Charles in uh, 1939 for the Grandmanan Historical Society. It shows 86 wares all around the island. About every thousand feet there was a herring wear. Uh, Nowadays, there are nine or 10 most years, and most people feel it's not likely to survive much longer um, because these more sophisticated technologies that can chase the herring in deep water uh, can uh, make a bigger catch faster and more wastefully than a herring wear. Herring wear actually can be a sustainable fishery because you, you put the, hair, the herring wear up and you wait for the fish to come. You can't chase them. You're in a relationship with the herring that's very, very different. So some say, in fact, there's a book uh, from this region called Herring, the only sustainable, herring Wear is the Only Sustainable Fishery. I'm going to be showing you, I want to mention one area on this uh, map. There's an area here called Cow Passage. Uh, and this is a very shallow area where it, it's almost down to the, to the uh, mud when the tide runs out. Uh, there, were, there were many herring wares in that area. And um, it was one of the, as I began to ask uh, around, uh, I, I wanted to find out, well, when did they start? What were they like? Uh, and I asked a lot of fishermen, and amazingly, many of them didn't really know much about the earliest herring wares. But one day I was at the farmer's market, and a young pilot who runs a charter service said, hey, oh yeah, there's, there's rock wares out in, out in Cow Passage. I'll take you out in the plane, and, and we'll go see him. And I said, okay. And I asked a lot of the fishermen I know. They said, there's no such thing as rock wares on Graham and Ann. No, no, no. Again and again, no, no, no. And I finally asked one fisherman who I uh, think is the most knowledgeable I know, Russell Ingalls. He said, oh, yeah. Go to the end of Shiloh Lane at the lowest tide of the year, which is the only time you'll see it, and you'll begin to see um, the remains of what we had been calling a rock ware or a stone ware. So really not impressive uh, <laughs> to the eye. There's a pile of stones covered with rockweed. And there's a line, mm, could be suspicious because straight lines, as some archeologists say, be suspicious if you see straight lines because nature doesn't make a lot of straight lines, especially in the sea. The tide goes out further. Here comes that rockweed. You begin to see a shape. Tide goes out further, you see the shape. Tide goes out all the way and you see here's, the, here's that rockweed wall leading up the beach. And the shape comes all the way around and there's this one opening, the fish come in, as the tide goes out they're trapped, you can block that off, they can take their carts down there and gather the fish. Probably what we're seeing is the remains of one of these wares, a ballasted ware. What we're seeing is the stones because all of that brush and the timbers would have been washed to sea. 
It may have been used as late as 1920s or 30s. So I decided to uh, go ahead and take the flight with our captain and see what he had to show me with the rock wares. And I, I uh, invited to come along Russell Ingalls, the fisherman who had told me um, about the rock wares, because he was extraordinarily interested in this history, which is really n inadequately documented on the island. And also Peter Cunningham, who is a fine, fine photographer. And uh, these aerial photos, and some I'll show later, are uh, from Peter Cunningham, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful to him for his work. So we get out to Cow Passage, and from about a thousand feet, you're flying along, and you see this remarkable shape out in the low water. If some of you were here for um, Nieves Sedeño's talk about the bison drive, remember that shape with the funnel uh, driving the bison? Well, same shape here, a really good shape for gathering um, prey. I like to call this the work of a master builder. This is nothing but stones hauled by human hands. Maybe they had an ox cart, possibly, to help out. So the way this works, herring stem the tide. So the tide, is, say the tide is rushing out of this shallow area. The herring, by instinct, are stemming the tide. They come in here and boom, there's captured in this, and then this can be blocked off. And then uh, as the tide goes out, um, they can come out with uh, ox carts and gather the herring. Well, we were astonished to see this and many others. But the weird thing is, once you start seeing them, you start seeing stuff everywhere. <laughs> you start seeing, oh, what's that round shape? And, Oh, what's this bar shape? And oh, there's another round shape. And actually, they, the, the, some of the local lore says that there were so many herring wares out in Cow Passage, you could hardly get a boat past the brush. So the amazing thing is that most islanders have not even known that this is their history. And so there's now tremendous excitement as people are, everybody was calling me up or sending me a Facebook message. Hey, I saw one in Castilia. No, I saw one in Will Cove. Hey, don't you think that's one at such and such a place? And people started seeing them everywhere as we began to become aware that there was history that was revealing itself to us if we knew where and how to look. Well, I do want to say something about the, uh, the other aspect of herring, which is that we love to eat them, uh, some of us, and I highly recommend doing so. The Graman Ann Cookbook, which came out in 1979, but I think dates much earlier than that. I think this is a reprint. But it has how charmingly an epigraph from a song about the herring. Uh, there was a um, uh, Alfred Percival Graves, sort of the 19th century Alan Lomax of the British Isles, was gathering um, folk songs uh, from Wales and the Highlands and, and really worked to renew interest in indigenous music of these places. And this uh, song is uh, right at the head of the cookbook. I, I would also say that there's not only lost technologies, lost songs, there's also lost recipes and lost food items that are <laughs> represented in this cookbook. Mostly it's a very simple cuisine. Um, fish, uh, potatoes, onions, milk. That's about it. Maybe a little salt pork. But there's also stuff like cod tongues and air bladders. Uh, recipes for those, well, delightful. Uh, <laughs> I did look up the hymn that um, Graves had quoted and uh, found, or folk song, and found wonderful versions of it. Uh, Let all the fine fishes that swim in the sea, the salmon and turboat, the cod and the ling, bow down the head and bend the knee to fine fresh herring our king. How delightful to have a king. Uh, that's a herring. And, and if you've been eating salt fish out of a barrel for six months, I think it probably does feel and taste like food for royalty. 
But the other thing that's interesting about the hymn is this line, or these two lines, for we have tempted summer in at the tale of fine fresh herring. So it's the fisher people who actually have the power, once they get the herring, to make the seasons turn. So important is that relationship between the fishers and the fish. So tuna may be the chicken of the sea. But herring are the king. You all know some food traditions around herring, Scandinavian seat pickled herring, um, and you can buy it at your local Safeway. In Germany, they're called roll mops. The Dutch have a herring festival. They like to eat it uh, raw, chased with a raw onion and a beer. I love and have great empathy for this child, this poor little girl, thinking, oh my God, this is my fate. What am I? <laughs> and here is uh, uh, Sicily, uh, Sicilian pasta dishes. Not uncommon to see a recipe for um, uh, linguine with sardines, pine nuts, and raisins. Very simple and delicious. Most of us would know sardines are herring in this form. A uh, tin can uh, with an easy pop top, cheap, healthy, delicious. Uh, canning sardines began with Napoleon, who, in order to support his military uh, ambitions, wanted to find a way to preserve fish for his uh, soldiers and uh, fostered or sponsored a contest with a cash award so that uh, the person who figured out how to preserve the, the herring ran away with the bag of cash. And so they, that actually, the canning of sardines, first in glass jars and then in, in tin cans, did begin with Napoleon's um, competition. Sadly, most uh, herring now in our region is going for bait for the lobster trade. As the waters warm uh, in southern New England, uh, the lobsters are moving north for the cold waters in Canada. We're having a gold rush of lobsters, and so the bait is being sold uh, to the lobster, and the herrings are being sold for bait to the lobster industry. For me, it seems a sad um, thing to do with such a delicious and nutritious and resilient um, food fish. However, um, you know that economy drives um, uh, many of the um, markets in this world and not what's good for community life. Uh, anyway, if you buy this brand, Brunswick sardines, there's a very good chance that these sardines were herring that were harvested in a weir on Grandmanan Island. So buy Brunswick sardines. Here's in the, every spring as the weirs are being built, we see the stakes on the beaches uh, being sharpened and then tied together in these rafts carried out to the weirs. We see birch poles for the saplings. We see these floating rafts called drivers that carry the pile driver out to drive the stakes into the weir. They carry their own little diesel generator. This is an image of the seining of that intruder weir. You can see um, how many boats have to go in there in the harvesting. This is the carrier. It's going through the gate. It's a very tight fit. And then there's the saner, and uh, you have a, a skiff in there. All the white that you see in the water is the fish scales that are just being thrown away. But it, an important detail is that they used to harvest all those scales. There's a, there's a Facebook group called Grandman Ann Wares that is um, maintained by Grandman Ann Fishermen. And they uh, have been throwing up old pictures. This picture just was posted this summer of somebody's dad uh, gathering the scales from a fishing boat um, in 1964. They would be gathered in these wonderful woven ash baskets made by the Passamaquoddy. And then they would be sold to a company called Merle Pearl. And they were used for fingernail polish, eyeshadow lipstick, and glittery car paint. So, next time you put on your eyeshadow and nail polish, thank a herring. Although now, um, those are all made from synthetics. 
Other lost knowledges, of course, some language that goes um, as fishing practices change, but I'm happy to report that the, the word hogshead is very much in play as the measure for uh, uh, the catch of herring. And a hogshead has been a term since 1423 originally for measuring whiskey. Of course, these wares are very vulnerable. This is what it looks like after a storm. When a storm is approaching, the fishermen have to go out and take the twine off a wear, even if it's the peak of the fishing season, as they did as Dorian was just heading to Nova Scotia. Other threats now, of course, climate change. So will there be herring in the future? Nobody knows, says Andy Pershing at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, there may be. Uh, there will be herring in the sea, and there may be new fishing techniques to catch them. This shows the uh, catch. From the, the illustration on the map shows that astonishing catch in the year 1919. And then you can see these declines. So what happened in 2012? Only 500 tons. 2012 was a year of an ocean heat wave. There were no Calanus, virtually no Calanus finmarchicus in the Bay of Fundy. So no copepods, no herring. Why? Who knows? They think maybe they went to deeper, colder water because the waters were so warm. So there's a researcher, a geneticist in Sweden at the Uppsala University, Leif Andersen, who's working on genetic sequencing of the herring uh, because he's interested in these uh, wonderful adaptive abilities of the fish and thinking if we could study the mechanisms by which these, this fish is so adaptive, maybe we can learn something in advance of this change um, that will help us to protect this species and even learn some things that can be useful to ourselves um, because um, actually the majority of the genes in a herring are, hello, <laughs> in us as well. But climate change is um, certainly a threat, but it hasn't ruined this fishery yet, and so I want to take you on a uh, journey uh, to Sane Aware so that you can have this experience because it's an astonishing experience. This is the Pat's Cove Ware. And uh, I got a call from my photographer friend, Peter Cunningham. Pat's Cove is full of herring. You want to go? Yes. So we went out. These are his pictures. Uh, again, you know, a beautiful work. So this is Russell Ingalls on the left. And the yellow vest is his father, Junior Ingalls, 90 years old. He was the one who sharpened those stakes on the shore. He didn't have the strength to start the chainsaw. He had his grandson start the chainsaw, and then he sharpened them all. Um, Russell was reluctant to build the wear. This was in 2018. He said, we've had so many bad years, you know. And Junior said, we're building it. <laughs> so <laughs> father spoke, and they did. But the men who continue, and they are almost all men. I do know one uh, woman who's working with her husband on a wear. Um, the, the men who do this do it out of a love for this tradition, a love for the, label and, uh, the, the labor, and a sense of the dignity of this work. You see the men all working together in this orchestrated uh, process. Uh, it's highly collaborative. It can be very gentle, you know. I, I, I could hear Russell say something like, hey, hey just ease it around there, boys. That, that's, that's really going to be hard on their hands. Uh, so it's not a kind of uh, macho. It's a very different kind of cooperative and gentle masculinity that involves an enormous amount of strength. It's quite fascinating to watch it. Here's the little seven-year-old, or nine-year-old in her 70s, still transfixed by herring and finding that this kind of research suits her much better than sitting in the library. What they're doing is they're dropping a seine net around. Brought, they brought a new net in that has lead rings on it. There's a diver at the bottom making sure that that net goes around the fish and not with the fish in the wrong place. Once they get that net all around the weir, they will gather it up with the lead rings and begin to raise it up. Here's Russell doing that same feeling for herring. So with his finger, 
just vibrating, feeling the vibration on the line, he will estimate how many hogsheads of herring are in that weir. It's a kind of skill, you know, that comes from experience. It comes generation to generation to generation. Of course, they have all the sophisticated technology, sonar and whatnot, but there is a certain uh, respect for some of these simple technologies, the hand and a line, a weighted line that work. So dusk is coming on. We're watching the net go around. We're waiting for the herring carrier to come, which has to come from several hours away. When it arrives, it enters the weir through that gate. It's a very tricky business, and sometimes one of the little skiffs will just kind of kiss the bow of that carrier and steer it so that it doesn't hurt the uh, nets as it comes into the weir. The nets are drawn up. There's no winch, no block and tackle, no power unit on this little skiff. This is, this is all hauling, just hauling ass, as we say. This is Russell's son, Chris. So we have three generations of this family harvesting these fish. Chris was the diver who set the seine net down below. He also was the diver when they were began hauling and they saw that there were some holes in the net. He dove down with his shuttle and twine and stitched the nets back together many skills. Here are the, here's the, the, again, this beautiful intensity, a slightly better photograph than mine, <laughs> as these fish come to the surface, um, and the, the catch turns out to be even bigger than was expected. By now, night has fallen. It's a, it's a moonless night. Nobody's really noticed that it's dark. People are working. Um, I'm taking notes. Peter's jumping around, taking photographs. So the little skiff is lined up against the carrier. The fish are being then pumped into the hold of the carrier. She's full to the max, as they say. And Russell says, he's surprised it's such a big catch. He says, it's a gift. It's a gift. He said it twice. And I know he meant it was a gift for his father, who was at 90, was the one who said, we're going to build the ware. And I also think that he knows, it because he's a pious man, it, that it's a gift from God. Well, we needed to have a second carrier because there were too many fish. And it was going to take many hours for the carrier to come. And so we had to sit and wait. And uh, so this is the carrier now absolutely full and riding very, very low in the water, a sign of bounty and joy for fishing people, certainly. Uh, it's the last night of summer on this dark, dark night, and it's about to head back to port. These are going to be taken to the mainland for sardines, happily. And uh, it turns out it'll be midnight before the other carrier will arrive. So uh, the skipper of the carrier says, I'll, I'll, I'll stick around and give you guys some light, you know, until he gets here. And Russell says, we don't need light. So the carrier goes thrumming off out to sea. And there we all sit. Some of the men have a smoke. We're just sitting, bobbing in the water, bobbing in the water. The seals are all around us, stealing herring, just making these huge muscular splashes. And there's bioluminescent bio uh, organisms in the water, which Russell calls fire water. And it's an absolutely beautiful and magical moment. Well, it was beautiful and magical for an hour for Peter and me. And then Russell said, you know, I could run you guys to shore if you'd like to go home. And we said, OK. Uh, so, we, so he did. And uh, he, this is, we're, he, he runs us to the shore on, on the skiff. And here we are on the rocky shore. And we can't find the path to get back to the road. It's like this passage from one world to another where we'd be dazzled. And he's shining light back at us, trying to show us where to go. I know it's a beautiful experience. So what's the condition of the Seal Cove, the center of the uh, smoking industry now? Well, it is bedraggled. The center of an industry for 200 years has been left to ruin. Here's that beautiful smoke shed. This is in better shape than most of them. They're falling into the ground. They're used for storage. They're used for plastic tubing for um, the construction of salmon cages, as they say, for the aquaculture. Despite the fact that these herring stands have been designated on the Canadian Register of Historic Places, 
uh, 54 buildings, mostly built between 1870 and 1930. And they're designated for being evocative of the whole smoked herring industry in the North Atlantic. This community, Seal Cove, its importance as a center of the industry. And this kind of idea of a, of a vernacular landscape between the sea and the built environment um, that speaks to a historical period that is melting away. It's my wish and the wish of a, a group of us on the island who've been meeting for a few years is to try to have a herring era museum. As they have in Iceland, a beautiful herring era museum, there's one in Scotland as well, to celebrate this heritage because we're already seeing things lost to memory. And for, if these wares stop for this to be lost to memory, it seems to me would be a, a heartbreaking loss. So. Uh, whether we can pull that off or not, we don't know. But apparently it means absolutely nothing to have a, a historic designation because there's no money attached to it. Well, one still can be surprised by sardines as a beautiful food, as my daughter and I were in Paris in 2015, finding a little Basque restaurant that served these very fancy and elegant sardines in a can with my <laughs> terroir potatoes. <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of thrilling. I eat them anytime I see them on a restaurant menu, and I, um, I'm a great advocate for um, trying uh, this fish because it is nutritious and it is low on the food chain, which means it doesn't accumulate heavy metals and toxins that fish high on the food chain uh, accumulate. So. Um, I know that people are quite snobbish about sardines, but this is a marvelous uh, fish for eating, and I highly encourage you to be experimental. Of course, the herring are important in the whole food web, not only to us. This is important always to remember that all of this is connected, and this whole community that I'm talking about is not only the community of the people and the fish, but the community of all the life that lives in this rich, 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 rich part of the Atlantic. The herring wares are not gone. There were nine in 2018, I think 10 in 2019. There was a good haul in 2018. But they're certainly, as a, as a method, they're endangered. The federal government in Canada just last year passed legislation to try to protect inshore fisheries as traditional fisheries, which in Canada means it's owner-operated. It's not multinational corporation-operated. Because it, there's a big difference in terms of sustaining communities on both the east and west coasts of Canada um, based upon who is managing the fishery and, of course, increasingly the selling of the fish uh, and the processing of the fish is happening in large uh, uh, corporate homes, not in these multi-beautiful kind of multi-family uh, shared fisheries. This is a ware called the mumps. I'll just show you a few pictures of the beautiful wares from 2018. This is Bradford's Cove, which has a uh, a, an extra pound on it, they call. So they, this is what they call a superware. So if they get herring, they can scoot them over into the pound, block it off, and wait till they get the other uh, bunt of the ware filled, and they can make a killing. They get $600 a hogshead for herring right now for bait. So if you got 100 hogshead in one day, you made $60,000. That's pretty good. There's Pat's Cove, which we've seen. Well, I think there's no better way to celebrate uh, a tradition than with a song. So I was thrilled to find this song performed by the British group Folly Bridge, celebrating the relationship between people and herring. So let's uh, have a listen. No one will do with me. No, oh, Nicky. <laughs> <coughs> Start with the chorus like you did last time, Metcalf. Yeah. <coughs> The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea, sing for the all day all day. Oh, what'll I do with me herring's head, I'll make it into a loaf of bread, I'll make it into a loaf of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea, sing for the all day all day. 
So what'll I do with me herrings? Eyes I'll make them into puddings and pies. I'll make them into puddings and pies and all sorts of things. Herrings, eyes of puddings and pies. Herrings, and of loaves of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea. The herring is the fish for me. The herring is the king of the sea. Sing a baller a little all day. No what'll I do with me herring spins, I'll make em into needles and pins, I'll make em into needles and pins and all sorts of things. Herring spins and needles and pins, the herring's eyes of puddings and pies, herring's head of loaves of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea. Sing of all around it all day. No what'll I do with me herrings back? I'll make it into a laddie called Jack. I'll make it into a laddie called Jack and all sorts of things. Herrings back, a laddie called Jack. A herring spins and needles and pins. Herrings eyes of puddings and pies. Herrings eggs of loaves of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea. The herring is the fish for me. The herring is the king of the sea. Sing of all the round little all day. No what'll I do with me herrings gills, I'll make em into window sills, I'll make em into window sills and all sorts of things. Herrings gills are window sills, herrings back a laddie go jack, herrings fins and needles and pins, the herrings eyes of puddings and pies, herrings head of loaves of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea. Sing a baller a little all day. No what'll I do with me herring's tail? I'll make it into a bottle of ale. I'll make it into a bottle of ale and all sorts of things. Herring's tail, a barrel of ale. Herring's gills, a window sills. Herring's back, a laddie go jack. Herring's fins, a needles and pins. Herring's eyes, a puddings and pies. Herring's head, a loaves of bread and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea, the herring is the fish for me, the herring is the king of the sea, sing a baller a little all day. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all. I hope the herring has been raised in your esteem a bit tonight and that some of these traditions are now uh, things that you might consider as being worthy uh, for us to cherish, protect, and celebrate. Thank you very much for coming. Marvelous. Please join us tomorrow, uh, next Thursday where uh, we will have Kelsey John talking about the Navajo horse. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>